Good afternoon, good evening to everyone present here. Hope you're enjoying the fourth day of the virtual carnival Sankalp, as I would like to call it. Uh, thank you for joining us for the discussion on climate smart agriculture technologies, the next billion dollar opportunity. We are being joined by eminent panelists from across the time zones. Uh, Dr. Parmesh Shah, Global Lead for Data Driven Digital Agriculture from the World Bank Group. We have Jacqueline Muchuri, uh, Project Coordinator and Technical Advisor with SNV, the Netherlands Development Organization. We also have Dr. Venkat Maroju, CEO of SourceTrace and Actec Enterprise from India that is now present in over 29 countries. Uh, the session will be moderated by Santosh Singh, Director in Telecap, heading the Agriculture and Climate Practices at the organization. Uh, we have designed the session to be interactive, so please feel free to engage with the speakers and other participants through the chat box. Apart from the panel discussion, we are also showcasing three very interesting Actec enterprises from across the globe. Uh, we have Mimosa Tech from Vietnam, an Actec enterprise that supports the farmers in managing inefficiencies in agriculture, such as wastage of water due to over irrigation and overuse of fertilizers. From Kenya, we have Lintera, an Actec startup that develops climate smart solutions for African farmers. And last but not the least, we have an Indian enterprise. Uh, with whom we'll be starting the session today, Ecozin. The enterprise offers a clean and innovative technology to handle perishables across the agri-value chain. Uh, the represent representatives from each of these enterprises are expected to be present with us during the session. Please feel free to connect with them through the chat box or through Brella platform. Before I allow Santosh to take over the session uh, and engage with the speakers and, and in an interactive discussion, uh, let us first quickly uh, look at the video from Ecozen. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yes, don't you? There are about 25,000 farmers who use Ecozen's products on a day-to-day -day basis to irrigate their lands or uh, to store fruits, vegetables that they harvest. So the effects of climate change are real and that affects the farmers a lot. With Ecozen's products, the effects of climate change are being mitigated. Now that the farmers have access to solar energy, uh, they can irrigate their lands uh, without being dependent on rains. With Ecozen's solar-powered cold room, the farmers are now able to store their produce right after the harvest, uh, which ensures that the nutritional value and the quality of the produce is maintained over time, which helps them get better pricing, uh, which helps them reduce the amount of wastage that used to happen uh, because of post-harvest uh, handling. Uh, and that is helping the farmers a lot to improve their income significantly. Uh, sometimes there is an oversupply and they have to sell their produce at throwaway prices. Now they can choose when to sell their produce and that helps them get the right pricing. From this year we are using Ecofrost pre-cooling unit for uh, our strawberry. We have started our business from last three years but before two years we are not using pre-cooling unit. So we are facing uh, lots of problems like boiling strawberry, uh, strawberry fruit is very soft. Ecofrost pre-cooling unit help us to minimize our losses and increasing our uh, shelf life of strawberry. So Ecozen's vision is to enable farm to fork uh, value chain of perishables. Um, the first leg of that is irrigation that we have, we have been solving. The second leg has been storage right after harvest. And with our new products and services coming in, we are helping farmers connect uh, you know, directly to the market so that they are able to sell at the right time to the right place uh, uh, through our solutions of uh, Market Connect as well as logistics uh, solutions that we plan to build in the future. Over to you. Okay, yeah. 
So thank you, Charu. Thank you for setting the context and uh, good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to uh, participants coming from different time zones uh, and welcome to this season. And I have a very, very uh, experienced and knowledgeable panels uh, speakers with us. And I want to kind of uh, use this opportunity to extract as much insight on climate smart technology and its potential and make this session interactive. So uh, just for the sake of giving you clarity how the session is structured, as you see that we started with a showcase of an enterprise. We have two more showcases across the session, which we would be doing at some point of time. But there are three critical questions that this panel and this uh, session is trying to address. One, what we know about climate smart technologies. What are the kind of huge cases? Why we need to even talk about that? If these technologies have potential, how we can scale them up? And if we can scale them up, what are the kind of things we need to do? What are the kind of barriers in investment? What are the kind of barriers in ecosystem that we have that we need to address? But before I go into that, to give you the context, I think climate smart technologies is a, a, a relatively new word. But those who are working on agriculture or in that space uh, might connect that there have been many technologies which were uh, classified uh, not as a climate smart technology, but those were climate smart technologies. I think. Uh, uh, drip irrigation, solar pumps, uh, many of these things were climate smart technologies uh, examples, but we did not call them climate smart technology. So I would take a minute to kind of highlight why this new category and why we are having focus on that. So uh, we're trying to see that if there's a formal definition of climate smart technology, there is none. There is no one, uh, there is no definition of climate smart technologies, but there is a definition or understanding of what is a climate smart agriculture. And it rides on three pillars. Basically, we talk about how to increase productivity, how to make the agriculture adapt to climate change, and how to decrease the footprint or decrease the uh, emissions from the agriculture. There are three things. If these three things meet, we typically call this a climate smart agriculture. And any of the technologies which help agriculture sector achieve that, basically get classified as climate smart technologies. Now, while we'll get more clarity about climate smart technologies as we go and showcase and learn from our esteemed panel, but some of the things that we have been looking at climate smart technologies is that now a very, very broad range. So even the technology which reduce waste, technology which makes farmer to uh, a, a kind of crop, the right kind of uh, seeds, right kind of practices, right timing, right kind of logistics, all of them have been clubbed into climate smart technology. So, so the, the range has become quite wide. And, and, and this is the context of the climate smart technology that we're trying to see that there's a new set of technologies which are emerging, which basically make the farmers be more productive through different intervention at the same time, help them mitigate the footprints of agriculture as well as adopt them to uh, changing climate. So that's the broader uh, thing. And why we need to do this, I think uh, uh, it goes without saying that most of us know that the agriculture systems are under tremendous pressure. They have to feed more people. And they have to also uh, make sure that their carbon footprint or their emission footprint is within the limit. At the same time, they are immune to those systematic challenges coming from climate change. So, so the climate smart technology become very, very critical system, critical kind of focus areas in order to safeguard our uh, food system, safeguard our agriculture and create the new paradigm the way we can look at the agriculture in the future. So, so that's the context of that. Now. I would like to kind of briefly, uh, you know, give the perspective of the three panels that we have here. I think Charu did a quick introduction, but I think uh, there's a lot more about, uh, you know, to know about them and you can go to Brilla platform and know about that. But uh, just summarizing a few lines about their perspective and they can add to that. Uh, Dr. Parmesa has been leading a lot of work at the World Bank, which cuts across multiple technologies, multiple kind of intervention in agriculture and several other innovations. And I think uh, he brings that larger perspective, larger picture, both looking at the past, that what has worked, what has not worked, and looking at the future, that where things should be headed. Uh, Mr. Winkert, being a founder of a, a technology company, which is focusing on climate technology, brings the right kind of practitioner's view that what problem they're trying to solve, how that can be scaled up, and how that can be uh, you know, taken to the right kind of scale. And Jacqueline, uh, working with... Uh, and on the ground with the farmers brings a lot of understanding that how on the ground realities 
need to be factored in and what are the kind of uh, perspective that we can learn to scale this thing up. So that's the setting of the context and the way the session is structured, I would have the first set of remarks from each of the panelists for uh, say three minutes and then we move on to the next round of questions. So for me, the first question that I would like every panelist to uh, kind of answer and I'll start with Dr. Sa, is that given your experience and uh, you know work that you have done across multiple agriculture technology and multiple kind of spaces, what are some of the areas where you see technology play a strong role in building climate change resilience and, and, and kind of uh, you know a climate smart agriculture being more possible? Over to you, Dr. Sa. Thank you, Santosh, and uh, uh, good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone. Uh, clearly, we are at a cusp of uh, very interesting developments which are happening. In the, in the, so the biggest one is the whole uh, data and the digital technologies interfacing with the earlier technologies. So you said, Santosh, these technologies are not old. These technologies, there was no measurement. There was no way of converting measurement into monetization. So I think it is more the question of how these technologies will shape up uh, ultimately and be converted into their full potential. But having said that, there are three clusters. I would say the one which is going to become the most prominent as we go forward will be soil carbon. Soil carbon is the biggest contributor to uh, you know, the climate change. And in the past, because we are not able to measure it and we are not able to monetize that, and convert that into payment for farmers. So this could become a very big income stream for farmers, the carbon sinks, which are created through soil carbon. And along with that come a lot of uh, technologies which have to do with how do you do precision agriculture, precision soil fertility, all those things related to that. So that's one cluster of technologies, which I think is going to be the biggest you know, cluster going forward. And we clearly see a lot of very big innovations going on on, on how those technologies could be digitized, how that data could be collected through IoT sensors and things like that. So we see huge potential in that. The second cluster uh, is clearly the whole, the one on energy. Uh, so the ones there also the major changes now, as you said rightly that solar farms and all that, but now we are looking at solar to be utilized for, you know, uh, 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 what you call it cooling and value addition. And the processing, you know, and, and we have so many SMEs and all working on the on that part, and 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 related to that would come the logistics part, and so the logistics will become a big opportunity as we go forward, in which we look at logistics, but not as just providing logistics, but climate smart logistics. And that is very. The third cluster is clearly the water cluster, basically, because it's also the whole precision irrigation and precision. Uh, you know, uh, what saving and all those kinds of things, because water is again a very big contributor to the climate, uh, you know, uh, flows, climate smart flows, which is primarily on adaptation and mitigation as well. The final cluster, which I think has not been considered as climate smart, is the food loss and waste, the supply chain related things. I think what people don't know that food loss and waste contributes more to climate change than lots of other things which we talk about. So, uh, so if these four things are then bundled and offered as a solution, so I, so we have a lot of point solutions right now on technologies, but if we are able to bundle these solutions and offer an end-to-end kind of a, uh, a solution on climate smart agriculture, that would be the something which would be the most biggest, you know, triple win there. But as we say, it should be productivity for farmers, profitability for farmers, and climate adaptation. So it is a triple bottom line kind of technologies which will show a huge potential going forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think the soil carbon thing is quite interesting considering that it opens up a whole lot of things to be kind of becoming more viable with a new source of revenue. So we'll, we'll uh, catch up more on that. Uh, Mr. Venkat, you know, uh, you have been running a company that basically does a lot of things that we have been talking here. So. What's your thought? How you see, you know, the climate smart technologies? What are the kind of roles they can play in the agricultural sector, and, and and how you are looking at some of your own offerings in that space? Yeah, thank you, um, Santosh, and uh, uh, as um, uh, Dr. Parmesh uh, mentioned, 
um, the agriculture has um, a, a very big contributor to the uh, you know carbon footprint in the world. I mean, according to certain reports, it's uh, as big as uh, one third of uh, you know all the carbon and greenhouse emissions uh, come from agriculture, right? Uh, one way uh, the inputs that are um, used, uh, you know, uh, chemical inputs uh, into the agriculture, then you have um, logistics and food processing. If you add all of them together, it, it is one of the biggest, uh, including water irrigation, the power consumed in water. Um, all of them about thirty to you know. Um, 35% uh, of the carbon emission. So it's, it's a very big contributor. So that is one um, side of the equation, but the other side is uh, climate, um, the greenhouse effects also have a very, very adverse impact on the production of agriculture itself, right? So you're a contributor, but also you're a recipient. So it's, it's a double-edged sword. So this is uh, needs to be addressed uh, because according to one of the 2012 CJIA report, uh, the yields of some of these crops could go down from 10 to 20 percent, you know. Um, so this is a, a, a very, very big challenge uh, on both sides. So there's a lot needs to be done in agriculture. And one of the uh, sad thing, but also a, an opportunity right now is um, the agriculture has been historically been a, one of the least digitized sector, okay? Um, but uh, I think things are uh, changing. Like even when we started working in this space around 2013, uh, you know, the, the digital technologies that have been appetite for adoption uh, has been very low. So, uh, but the pervasive, you know, the, the proliferation of mobile technologies combined with the smartphone, I mean, uh, smartphones, uh, ubiquitous, uh, nature of smartphones has really, really enabled a lot of technologies, a lot of um, solutions, as well as uh, the inclination or appetite for uh, adopting these technologies. And it is actually still at a very nascent stages, but uh, we could only hope uh, it'll go up. I think for the uh, places where uh, there's a big agriculture in developed economies, there has been a much higher level of adoption of technology, but whereas, you know, the smallholder farmer agriculture where 70% of the production happens uh, has been one of the very, very uh, inefficient. And these technologies have a huge role to play. So in that uh, context, um, you know, a company like SourceTrace, we basically uh, have solutions to digitize end-to-end uh, -end agriculture value chain, uh, starting from the farmer to the fork. And um, especially when it comes to that first mile, I mean, we call that first mile where the farmer farm um, and the agriculture starts. It's not the last mile like the telecom companies sometimes like to call. Um, we have uh, solutions or there are many other companies uh, having that um, information on the ground uh, from the farmer farm crop and with that information, you combine with the weather, um, you know, uh, right now there's hyper local weather, there's a lot of advances being done and hyper low uh, weather um, systems and uh, much better um, precision and local uh, localized weather. Uh, then with some level of remote sensing uh, technologies, uh, and in some cases you have IOTs, you know, um, there's, there have been advances in that sector also, even though in the smallholder farm con farmers context, it's been pretty low, uh, these IoT devices and, you know, the affordability and other reasons, the connectivity and all that, but it, it's only going to be uh, going in the, in the positive direction. So there'll be a lot of advances you can see. With all this, uh, you have a, a situation where there's a rich data available. And so by this, like I, like I said initially, uh, there is a consumption of the resources in agriculture itself, right? That needs to be contained. So uh, you could be much better uh, efficient in uh, the consumption of CM, like a fertilizer, pesticides, and a water irrigation, right? These are the big inputs. And then a uh, second thing is you also optimize the entire value chain. Um, like you've shown the video, uh, the food loss is a very big issue. Right, if you can contain even uh, you know five percent to ten percent of the food loss, uh, you're talking about a huge savings in the um, you know the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So there is uh, overall the data will play a very important role 
and company like ours are basically uh, at the uh, very very uh, nuts and bolts of data collection to uh, you know building these algorithms big data with ai and ml and uh, we will only see a lot more uh, insights and a better use of as i said resources as well as reduction in the uh, emissions uh, from a best agriculture practices as well so i will start thanks, thanks venkat yeah so so i think I, i caught a very good perspective of the clusters which are relevant for climate smart technologies and and got good perspective that how data and the kind of digitization of agriculture value chain can give a lot of insights and help us move forward now coming back to jacqueline you have been working a lot on the ground with the farmers and and, and you see that sometimes the kind of climate smart technology that we are talking from a supply side perspective and the demand side perspective is quite different there are very different kind of technologies or intervention being adopted so would you like to share your thoughts on that how climate smart technology or what kind of climate smart solutions are kind of being valued or should be valued from a a uh, grounds perspective like from the farmers perspective who are the end user or recipient of those technologies yeah thanks santosh and good good morning good afternoon good evening um talking from the farmer side um our experience has been that uh for farmers to adopt uh climate smart irrigation technologies it has to make uh financial sense for them so if they are producing for the market they have to 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 get a market for their produce and that the irrigation technology must be affordable to them and in the end they have to resort to increased income but just to look at what are the some of the irrigation technologies that make sense to farmers um for farmers in the arid regions um or for farmers who are experiencing varied uh, climate varied uh, seasons um it then means they do not have a sufficient amount of water during especially during the dry season or when they are when during the rainfall season then they have a lot of water such that their crops will get submerged in water and not get the right uh, productivity that they want so farmers are keen on irrigation technologies that will result in um increased water use efficiency this means that they are able to balance between the dry and the the the, the rainfall season such as they able to store water during the dry season during the rainfall season and use that water during the dry season so and talking of such technologies uh, farmers are quickly adopting water storage uh, like water pans or plastic tanks and they are also adopting things like shallow wells because then that balances of the equation of water during the two varying seasons then uh, farmers are also looking at um, wanting to bundle irrigation technologies uh, as a package so for a farmer if we're talking about uh, getting a, a water abstraction method like a pump if we're talking about a solar pump which for them is climate smart they will also want to understand what kind of application methods come with this solar pump so they are looking at not just uh, the solar pump but what is the package or what is the other component of irrigation technologies that works together with the the, the, the irrigation technology in question they do not look at them at, as uh, independent technologies then on on the part of um, food waste and post harvest uh, losses um farmers uh, mostly get a lot of losses from this especially because sometimes markets are not reliable or they want to keep the produce further so that they get uh, better prices in the future so in the end they end up uh, losing a lot of produce from 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 their farms and and for them this contributes also to huge losses in terms of uh, the amount of income that they're getting from the farmers so this is a priority to them but uh what i can say is that um access to irrigation technologies is still uh wanting because the local suppliers do not sometimes reach the 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 very rural farmers because they are mainly um located in uh, national in the main cities so there is need for increased access of the irrigation technology so that the farmers can adopt more thank you 
I think it's a very good point. I think uh, what farmers are looking at, like overall solution, and and they want to kind of uh, make sure that there is a financial incentive for them to adopt those technologies, as well as uh, the technologies are available and uh, things. So, uh, before I kind of move on to the next question, which I'll give you right now, uh, we will have a video about the uh, water efficiency and something there. But while the video is on, I would give this time for you to think about the next question or next kind of discussion that we are having. is what are the challenges that we see in scaling up this uh, technology how we don't see this technology scale up as fast as it should be so uh, why do you think about the uh, responses i would let my colleague showcase a video of a farm that is doing work in water efficiency over to you sudhanshu nước bao nhiêu là đủ, bón phân như thế nào là hợp lý là bài toán làm vườn mà một nhóm bạn trẻ đã từng trăn trở cách đây nhiều năm. Quyết tâm giải quyết bài toán này, năm 2014, công ty Mimosa Tech ra đời, ứng dụng nền tảng internet vạn vật IoT tạo ra giải pháp nông nghiệp chính xác. Thì Mimosa Tech đã ra đời để đưa công nghệ vào trong nông nghiệp để làm thế nào mà giúp cho bà con nông dân có thể trên cùng một mảnh ruộng cùng các yếu tố đầu vào như phân thuốc có thể đạt được năng suất cao nhất và vẫn đảm bảo các yếu tố phát triển bền vững cũng như bảo vệ môi trường và bảo đảm sức khỏe của người làm nông. À, thời gian đầu thì chúng tôi cũng gặp nhiều thử thách à, với tâm lý bà con nông dân thường hay e ngại khi tiếp cận một công nghệ mới. Cho đến nay thì giải pháp Mimosa Tech đã trở thành một phần không thể thiếu trong quy trình trồng trọt của bà con nông dân canh tác nông nghiệp hiện đại. À, đã có hơn 1.000 nông hộ trên khắp tỉnh thành trong cả nước áp dụng giải pháp Mimosa Tech và chúng tôi cũng rất tự hào khi đã góp phần tiết kiệm được 88 triệu lít nước trong canh tác nông nghiệp. Từ công ty lúc đầu chỉ có hai người, những công nghệ made in Việt Nam do chính Mimosa Tech thiết kế và làm chủ bắt đầu ra đời từ các thiết bị cảm biến độ ẩm đất, điều khiển tự động hóa, quản lý tưới, quản lý dưỡng chất, phân bón. Mimosa Tech hiện là công ty duy nhất tại Việt Nam được CB Insights liệt kê trong nhóm 100 công ty công nghệ toàn cầu đang So the answer is stopped. I think uh, I think we have seen that. So it paused for me. So yeah, so don't shoot. Pause. So I think uh, there's some error at your end. But uh, I've pasted yes. the link here. So if anyone wants to follow up, uh, uh, and I'll also share the website of the uh, enterprise so that people can follow. Okay. So so uh, if you can just remove that from the screen, and uh, as I uh, said earlier before the video that. The next question I want my panelists to kind of throw light on is that we have tới thì chúng tôi muốn áp dụng công nghệ vào trong quy hoạch quản lý vùng trồng vùng nguyên liệu thì chúng tôi Yeah. So so uh, the question that I wanted uh, you know my panelists to kind of throw light on is that we know about the importance of this technology we know that there are several technologies exist right now but still we don't have the kind of adoption that we typically want to see despite the need despite the kind of value add they have and i want uh, this question to uh, get a response from venkat first as uh, you have been you know putting these solutions on the ground so what is your take on why these uh, solutions are not growing or being adopted at the pace that you want so your thoughts on the challenges in scalability or or rapid adoption of this uh, solution yeah um, santosh so there is um Uh, many challenges like uh, i said the agriculture has been historically um, even today one of the least digitized sector and there are reasons for it right um, the reason is um, you know the the margins in agriculture are, are are very very thin okay so most of the time uh, justifying a business case uh, to adopt these technologies is is very very uh, difficult okay so that's a, that's the biggest uh, um challenge and then the uh, other challenges are i mean especially when I mean, again I, i want to talk in the context of smallholder farmer agriculture um most of them are happening you know it's like a two hectares the average smallholder farmer holds two hectares and uh, the farmers are illiterate semi literate so these type of uh, a group of uh farmers you want to bring advanced technologies and like i said the the cost is one big barrier but the, the next there is neither sophistication uh, nor the scale 
to bring any modern technologies to bear at this level of uh, you know grassroots level so it takes a very very creative models uh, to bring these technologies at scale so one of the important thing we believe in is uh, uh, you know you need to have uh, some level of aggregation of these farmers right um, that's the most important thing so in you know it could happen many ways like if it could be a farmer cooperatives farmer producer companies there is a big push uh, i think um, in india and we see this all over the place the lot of governments uh, are pushing to you know uh, farm this to give a lot of incentives even though you know there there's a whole discussion about all this farmer cooperatives how efficient and how uh, well uh, they've been promoted uh, then there's a lot of all this you know uh, come like world bank to you know vsi dfid they're also promoting a lot and i think uh, it should only accelerate and that's the only way i people like me see uh, the adoption of this uh, uh, really really sophisticated technologies that could bring in uh, two things right one is you create scale the second thing is you need a sophisticated agency to intermediate these technologies uh, to bring uh, to these farmers uh, uh, and at the grassroots level so th those are the, um, you know uh, very important and then of course there's a lot of uh, private sector also uh, you know indulging in some type of uh, uh, contract farming right so they will be uh, aggregating they will be uh, establishing um, you know clusters and aggregating and uh, they could bring these technologies at scale i think it has to happen in uh, many different directions um, but it is happening it is happening but at a, at a much slower pace so that, i mean that my experience really comes from the smallholder farmers and uh, those are the challenges we see um, in all over the place yeah no i think that's a very valuable insight so i'll, I'll move to jacqueline to uh, see what you see as major challenges in adoption and the scale up of these technologies. I think uh, uh, some of the points that Venkat said are very valid, but you want to add to those from your ground stop perspective? Thank you. Uh, I, I, I think um, the, the challenges are not very different uh, across the globe. Correct. And uh, what we are seeing is that uh, an increasing number of smallholder farmers are contributing to global food security. And uh, we have them making decisions on their own on their farms and buying the kind of irrigation technologies that they want. But then um, there is still a gap in the adoption of irrigation uh, technologies. And for me, I think the very, um, the, the, the very first challenge that farmers have is that they are not able to afford uh, the climate smart irrigation technologies. So once a farmer is not able to purchase an irrigation technology by cash, then they also have a problem with access to finance because then um, farmers um, are not able to access finance from financial institutions because there is a common belief that maybe the, 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 the main banks have very high interest rates. And so farmers do not um, commonly um, approach the, the, the main banks. But then even when, um, like the irrigation technology suppliers have developed a pay-as-you-go system, um, it still does not work for, for, for most of the farmers. And uh, just talking to a few irrigation technology uh, companies here in Kenya, what we've seen is that uh, developing a pay-as-you-go system and implementing it does not necessarily result in an increase in sales of uh, the irrigation technology suppliers. So if we can find a way of working around uh, access to finance and finding out what are the best solutions for these farmers, I think that would work for them. The other big challenge that I think is there is the, the lack of knowledge of the existing uh, product, both financial products and the irrigation technologies uh, themselves. Uh, financial institutions have argued that they have very good uh, products uh, for, for, for the farmers. They have them in the shelf, and, but some, some of the times the farmers do not know about, about them. So I think that there's a gap between, um, there's a communication gap between uh, the farmers and the irrigation technology and financial uh, product suppliers. So if that gap can be bridged, uh, I think that would work very well for them. Thirdly, some of the technologies that are introduced, for instance, in Kenya or in the African continent, um, do not necessarily match the farmer needs. So a, a certain technology could be working in a different continent or in a different country. 
that does not necessarily mean that if we get that uh, technology in Kenya, we are definitely going to have it work in the specific farm situation. So farmers have different and varying farm, farm situations. And so if you're talking about irrigation technology suppliers scaling up or getting uh, optimal sales for their products and services, they have to have a market, like a common market of farmers with common farming conditions. But then um, as much as we may have farmers in the same location, farmers have very different uh, farm practices. So it's a matter of how can different companies come together so that they're able to solve problems in a common location in such a way that the needs of each farmer are addressed. Thanks. Thank you. So, so Dr. Parmes, I think uh, we heard about the uh, aggregation challenge, we heard about the affordability challenge, we heard about the customization challenge, we heard about uh, the context being a bit kind of problem because the technologies are trying to kind of one solution fits all. But I also want to see that apart from these, or, or you want to add more perspective to that because uh, you know we all are working for quite some time uh, for promotion of different agriculture technology. Forget about uh, you know the climate smart technology and some of the challenges are generic to all the technologies. So have you learned something? How, how do you see the problem uh, here? Thanks, Santosh. And I think uh, very relevant points raised by Venkat and Jacqueline. I think clearly we just finished a study in Africa on why these things are not getting scaled up. I'll send a link out you know, to people to look at it. We found that in spite of 1,485 innovators working on this, only 175 have the potential to scale up. And when we started looking at why they are not scaling up, we found that all of them spent 80% time on collecting data and only 15% time on products and services and only 5% on scaling up. So all of them are stuck at this 3000 farmer level all the time, you know, and they're not able to cross that rubric. So we feel very strongly that we need to invest in a data stack, which is then available to everyone, you know, so that they spend more time on innovating on business models, products and services and things like that. So I personally feel that as Venkat rightly said that data and digitization will really liberate this sector completely. So I think there is a need for investing in data as a public good and converting that into private good to exponentially quadruple the num products and services which are coming out. And I, I, we feel that as World Bank, we are now thinking that every agriculture project should make at least 10% investment in data and design all the agriculture projects very differently in this new way. So this is one data digitization. So imagine if all the FPOs and all the producer companies in India were digitized, all the key SMEs were digitized, you will see very strong uptake of technologies. And, I, and that's what we don't have very strongly. And in Kenya, we have now decided to, to launch a million farmer platform in which we are bringing the innovators and the financers and all together onto one platform and also investing in a data stack uh, there in Kenya. So I think that immediately we are seeing that we can go from 100,000 farmers to a million farmers. That's one. The second one I think is very important is that we haven't in invested enough in the innovation ecosystem of incubators and accelerators around these technologies. I think the kind of requirement which we have seen even in countries like Kenya and Nigeria and South Africa, which Africa, these are three which have at least some kind of an ecosystem for fintech and agtech there. Even there, we don't have enough in incubators and accelerators. So I think that investment has to be done in the same way as it happened in information technology some time back. We need the similar kind of scale of investment to there where a lot of innovators and entrepreneurs can test their ideas and then scale them up. We need thousands of ideas in the pipeline but we need accelerators so that the people who are not able to scale up are also able to scale up. So I think the innovation ecosystem investment is also very much required to do that apart from data and all. And finally, it will be the financing part. You know, it, it's a risk financing instrument. We need a lot of blended finance. We need a lot of patient capital. And so we need financing innovation uh, there so that small farmer models need different risk. Uh, medium farmers models need different risk, but we don't have any differentiated product offering. You go to any financial institution, it's offering a vanilla product there. 
So I think how do we differentiate in terms of financing options is the third one. So these three I consider are the most important reasons why things are not getting straight. I think that that's very well segues into the next uh, uh, set of question that I have. But I think the point you made about the uh, being a data stack, because I think we have seen number of cases where each of the entrepreneurs are trying to create the data, trying to create the similar set of kind of uh, information points, which is duplication of effort. So this is also very similar. This is the approach that we took for circularity in agriculture. We tried to kind of create a platform of a million farmers so that innovators can come and work on that rather than trying to reach out to the farmers. So uh, going to the next segment, and I will have a video before that, I, I think uh, uh, taking the clue from what uh, Dr. Sah just said that there is a lot of pieces that we need to plug in the ecosystem to make this scale happen, make the rapid adoption of climate technology happen, be it financing, be it innovation ecosystem, be the uh, uh, aggregation, be the data stack or data infrastructure. Now, I want all of you to think about that. What are the kind of business models? What role the corporates or the private sector can play in order to bridge these gaps and make the climate smart technology ecosystem flourish because some of these you know gaps or, or or kind of challenges also provide an opportunity for a financing innovation for for a kind of a tech innovations to come for a platform innovation to happen so so i think think about that and i play a video uh, here and then i'll come back to this question Once a month, Moses Kamani flies a drone over his client's fields. Africa has fertile soils, but crop yields here are often low. This technology could change that. The drone's camera captures the light that's reflected off the plants in various wavelengths, and so reveals information which the naked human eye cannot see. We fly closely over the crops, taking that image, Later on, we analyze and we can see if the crops are stressed. And why this is important, with a drone, you can actually see crop stress two weeks before you can see it with your naked eye. So it helps the farmer make the right decision in time before the crop has a loss. Moses Kamani founded the company Lentera Africa in 2016, together with a friend. His startup is one of 12 across Africa currently receiving guidance from the German government program for startups. He Skypes regularly with the German service provider for sustainable development, GIZ. The initiative supports startups in their search for investors. Up until now, most of Lentera's funding has come from the sale of fertilizers. The small business has also set up a demo system. Clients can use it to learn how to use the technology. This sensor measures the temperature, humidity and soil moisture. A special app developed by the startup then transmits the data free of charge to a cell phone. This is the weather. So Lentera Africa, we are a Kenyan-based agriculture technology company. We enable farmers adapt to climate change and increase their yield through precision agriculture, through climate smart inputs and through conservation agriculture. The soil sensors data is combined with additional information, regional weather forecasts and images from satellites, which can quickly capture large areas of land from outer space. The images come from the Sentinel-2 satellites. These eyes in the sky are part of Europe's Earth observation network, Copernicus. Every five days, they send a new image. The specialists at the startup then turn the data into valuable information for local farmers. The technology can evaluate a plant's growth and highlight potential problem areas. It's even possible to estimate how high a crop yield will be. They can actually make adjustments on the farm to safeguard their yield. Now, when you look at the soil moisture analysis, so for the soil moisture, it is blue, where the soil is good soil moisture distribution, yellow or green, where there's less soil moisture, or red, where it's absolutely dry. So what that tells us is the irrigation lines here are not working. Here, meanwhile, everything is going to plan. Ruth Gakenia has been using Lentera Africa's app for about a year. Her vegetables are flourishing. 
she can now sell 40% more produce than before to hotels and local markets. Thanks, Dan. So, so, so we had tried to kind of showcase some technology to give a flavor of the kind of range of technologies and interventions are there. But as I said, uh, you know, before we showed the video that I want to understand what kind of opportunities exist in this climate smart technology scale up uh, ecosystem that private sector financiers, innovators or other stakeholders can come and uh, invest into and, and kind of make a case for that. So uh, I would start with Jacqueline to see if there is a role for a private sector. And when I say private sector, I'm talking about entrepreneurs, financiers and other stakeholders who have business model to solve certain problems that stops climate smart technology from scaling up. You are on mute, Jacqueline. Yeah, Sorry. thank you. Um, what we are seeing is that uh, the private sector can benefit from piloting or trying out uh, upcoming or emerging business models uh, that can contribute to affordability and um, access, increased access of uh, irrigation technology to, to, to especially to smallholder farmers. And some of the business models that we're talking about are one, provision of credit guarantees to embed uh, climate smart irrigation solutions in uh, circles, that's the savings and credit cooperatives and microfinance uh, institutions. And this uh, could work because uh, farmers view circles uh, as friendly compared to the main banks. And therefore um, there could be a relationship between the technology suppliers and the, uh, the financial institutions um, in developing and uh, trying to pilot this, uh, this model. And just to give an example in Kenya, there's a pump, there's a solar pump uh, called the Rainmaker Pump that is manufactured by Sun Culture. And it's very expensive for smallholder farmers to afford it. And so they have developed a pay as you go uh, uh, model whereby this makes uh, the, the, the product affordable. Um, there are also other business models, one of them being the creation of a financing facility that is operated by the development financial institutions or the third parties. And um, this is most useful for remote locations where irrigation knowledge is limited. And therefore the facility can be operated by the development financial institutions or the government and can be made accessible to farmers and technology uh, suppliers as well as uh, local financial uh, service providers. There is also a very interesting model that's coming up here in Kenya, which is the lease financing and rent to own uh, models, whereby the irrigation technology uh, suppliers can get financing from the development uh, financial institutions, and they can, um, they can uh, give the, the product at, 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 at a, using a pay-as-you-go system or on credit to farmers, and farmers can then rent out the the, the, the product to other farmers and they can generate income uh, from that. And this will help the farmers optimize the use of the irrigation technologies and it will make uh, financial sense for them to really purchase the product and, and use it. Maybe on a more non-financial uh, opportunity, what we are looking at is uh, an opportunity for, for the government and the private sector to tap into horizontal learning, which we found very uh, important because farmers are mostly learning from other farmers. They will quickly pick irrigation technology uh, products and services that are being used by uh, other, other farmers. So the development organizations can identify and capacity build lead farmers and, uh, and, and use them to, to bring on board new irrigation technologies. And, and from this, they can generate an income because they'll be training um, uh, uh, through like they will be charging for the training and at the same time they will get a revenue from um, from showcasing products from irrigation technology uh, suppliers. Last but not least, I, I'll talk about the digitization of agriculture and, and because this is very attractive to the youth of today and I think this is the way to go. So if we digitize agriculture, uh, the, the youth will feel that they really want to engage in agriculture. Um, which will be different from the current uh, situation where we only find the older generation practicing agriculture. So this can be a bit more attractive for the youth. Thank you. Thanks. 
Thanks, Jacqueline. So, so Vinkat, I think quickly, I want you to answer, uh, you know, the role of other uh, players in this space, especially uh, in early stage of development of different kind of sectors, you see an entrepreneur playing multiple roles because there's no one else who can play that role efficiently. And you start playing those roles, even you know that I'm not the best guy to play that role. So do you see similar opportunity that can come into the space? For example, uh, you know, you try to finance things when somebody can finance better because there's no financier. So what do you see the role of other private sector players or the interventions uh, 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 that can help you scale these technologies? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a huge actually. Um, the like I said, one of the important thing is you know agriculture throughout the value chain. Uh, it, it, there are a lot of inefficiencies, okay, and the, each inefficiency is actually an opportunity for a business model, okay. Uh, right from input supplies, uh, the right targeting of the inputs uh, to what kind of uh, you know. Uh, crop you want to do it like you know just to uh, uh, you know having the advisory to the farmers and some mechanism to uh, uh, tell them what are the crop diversity that you need to have a given a geographic area you know some governments are forcing if you have a data uh, there is uh, you can target right and then based on that some of these large uh, um, uh, private companies uh, can suggest to the farmers from there to input supplies, targeted inputs to um, then, you know, of course, the growing itself, uh, you have a, a lot of advisory services, you know, uh, weather to satellite data to extension work um, to next, you know, when you're off taking, okay, uh, just just by having uh, a very good estimate of the harvesting of different uh, areas, different farmers, different crops, you can optimize a, a lot of things. Okay, and then from there to uh, when you're processing and uh, carrying it through the log logistics and up, uh, downstream in the value chain, uh, you could you could be uh, you know every place right in the agriculture you take it uh, there is an efficiency and that is an opportunity for uh, innovation and private sector players right but the storage uh, is a is a huge opportunity and so. Um, I mean, historically, a lot of, uh, you know, in developing countries, the government had to get involved, you know, right, we have seen that they will get involved in the loans to subsidies to uh, extension work to, um, you know, buying commodities at uh, MSP to storage, but, you know, they're not scaling. So there is a, a huge, huge opportunity for the five private sector to step up in each of the step and then in, in here uh, the technologies have a huge role to play you know uh, one is uh, i keep talking about because i'm a data guy there's a a, a, a lack of uh, information in every aspect of it so one is you collect data at each of the step and then second is you need to be able to have an efficient mechanism to share the data then the whole value chain could be optimized and in each of these, like I said, um, another thing is the finance. Um, there is a huge gap in agriculture credit. Uh, everybody knows there's so much written about it. And how do you make, uh, uh, bring this capital and how do you make the financiers more willing to lend? Because if they have more information and they can understand risk better, uh, they will be able to come up with the produce. I mean, we have implemented certain uh, cooperatives. Uh, only reason is we could organize their books and all that so that the financial could uh, feel much comfortable in lending. So there is opportunities um, everywhere and uh, the private sector is the only one can uh, bring at a scale, right? I mean, the, it, it's just not possible. Even the development organizations like World Bank, other, they will do some pilot projects, but they cannot sustain it over a period of time and it has to happen through the private sector. And I would say this is a, a, a huge, huge opportunity um, from all over the place. I mean, in all aspects of agriculture value chain. Thanks. So, so this puts very much uh, me to the uh, question that I had for Dr. Parmesa. So you see the private sector saying that there are a lot of opportunities and, and, and World Bank is known to be the player to build the market, to build this kind of platform where others can perform. So from your side, what are the things that you see private sector can play and what are the things that you have been doing which could enable these new business models or which could attract these players to come and play a role? So, so over to you, sir. So I think the basic rethink required is that we need to move from a conventional subsidy for inputs outputs model to an incentive-based model. 
which incentivizes payments for services. So payments for climate smart services, we have tried this approach in Latin America where we have monetized a lot of, uh, you know, these climate smart indicators and farmers get paid for the services, the, the innovators get paid for services. So basically you have to convert this into a blended finance model in which transactions can be monetized. So we spent billions of dollars on subsidies, you know, uh, which we give to the governments and governments convert into subsidies and we expect the input and output to change as a result of that. We feel that now uh, there's a radical thing we think required in terms of converting this into payments for service, like agriculture as a service uh, kind of a model, basically. It's like software as a service, agriculture as a service. So if we convert the whole agriculture business into a service model, and we have lots of private sector playing that role, then they will get also some amount of compensation for what they are doing and the businesses can become viable. So I think, I think that's what we are trying to move towards now, invest in data, invest in this uh, service model. And as Jacqueline was also saying that is also we are trying now an agripreneur approach. And we have now uh, developed a lot of young people who can become agripreneurs, you know, and, and they can then take this solution to a different level. So I think there's an enterprise investment required into the enterprise ecosystem. There is this payment for services kind of a model which we need to invest in. And then there is this investment required in this incubation innovation part there. So personally, I feel that if we redirect a lot of our investments, which is going into uh, subsidies, even 20% of that investment get redirected into a different financing model, we will not have a financing gap of the kind we are looking at. And the second thing is then we have to work with the financiers, particularly the banks are very conventional right now, the way they do these products. So if we can take six, seven big financing institutions and just develop this product line with them, it's a new kind of financing which they will have to do. And the third, we will have to invest more in the patient capital models because this is not going to happen overnight. We need to create this ecosystem of thousands of these innovators being able to scale up. And I think if we, we, we also have to take the 100 top uh, people with ideas, including the Venkat's idea, and then really do an acceleration kind of thing. SourceRays is already in 29 countries. In fact, they have scaled up primarily through their own initiative and entrepreneurship. But if there was a big push, which was there to support these acceleration ideas as kind of 100 acceleration ideas, we could get, achieve the scale much faster. So I'm just sorry that I'm just a little bit uh, <laughs> rambling yeah. here, but I think there are many options to do that. And we would like to invest in this space going forward very differently. And that's what we are looking for opportunities. That, that's a very good commitment, sir, because Sankalp is known for commitment and I would chase you for uh, how to support these initiatives. Uh, one couple of quick questions because we're running out of time. One is that a quick response. Considering that climate smart technologies are not affordable for small whole farmers, any thoughts on that? Quick thought, one line thought that how we can make it uh, there. I will ask Venkit first and then to uh, Dr. Sa especially from the audiences for you. Yeah, I wouldn't say it, they're not affordable is a, like a blanket statement. I said it, it is a challenge. It is a challenge. But like I said, right, you know, it has to be, um, you know, multiple places. Like we, we are deploying this to uh, largely to people who are producing a certified produce where they can command a premium pricing. Let's say one example, uh, like we, we reach, uh, we impact more than 1.2 million farmers and 70% of our uh, farmer base uh, are maybe higher is the uh, one way or the other they're certified. So they have an incentive uh, to adopt this because anyway, they have to maintain the internal control system. There's a huge data. So there's a motivation. And then that basically translate into some premium pricing and uh, 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 guaranteed markets and better markets. So there's an incentive there. So it is, uh, uh, it, then there's more inclination to adapt and invest in these technologies. Yeah. Okay, so so I'll hold on. So, sir, for uh, uh, Dr. Saad, there's a different question that I want you to quickly answer. The climate indicators, the indicators that can pitch uh, farmers a new source of revenue because they are doing climate smart practices. Uh, do you see this as a going forward a big push because this would enable a lot of smallhold farmers to achieve uh, financial uh, a kind of cushion? Exactly. I think the payment for services will be there. That's why we are now working on soil carbon measurement across many countries, uh, developing very simple tools 
including even satellite data. So you can even uh, don't have to go and do this everywhere. As Venkat rightly said, IoT could be very unaffordable for a lot of small holders, yeah. but really find solutions which are very creative, which are able to find crop measurement, you know, the, the data on soil carbon, all integrated into a score for farmers. Like we do create scoring through transactions. So we need a yeah. similar kind of innovation in terms of doing that. And the second one in terms of affordability will be pay as you go. Because I think with FinTech, I think what Jacqueline talked about Sun Culture, we are working with them now on solar pumps in, in Kenya. And really pay as you go means there is no upfront cost. It's like yeah. electricity meter in your house. If solar pump becomes like that, the whole thing becomes very different and gets scaled up very fast. Thank you, sir. So I think I'd like to conclude with uh, two lines. One is that I think uh, uh, it would be great uh, if uh, Parmesar can share some of these incentive-based services that we are talking about, the, the climate smart services that uh, if you can share some material, a lot of entrepreneurs and farmers can benefit. We can host it in our platform. Uh, the second thing is that we learned a lot from this. And I think uh, going forward, I would uh, request that any of these materials are available on respective company's website so audience can go and fetch more information from there about Jacqueline Venkat and, and, and Dr. Sa have been very, very helpful in kind of showcasing those nuggets because for us, one thing that is, I have felt that a lot of people are not aware of the climate benefits that they can monetize. And I think that's the one thing that we should be uh, taking away from the session. There is a possibility of DFIs, private sector, everyone coming together to make a billion dollar opportunity. And I thank all of you for your participation. There are a lot of questions that we could not answer, but I think most of the questions were covered in the later part of the uh, responses which our panelists give. But I think you are free to network on Brela, reach out to the panelists and ask those questions, seek those things. And, and I think uh, uh, this is a good way to kind of start the discussion on that. So with this, I thank Jacqueline, Venkat, uh, Dr. Parmes, and everyone else who has been part of the session and all the audience who have been watching through uh, different streaming options. Uh, we look forward for your participation in Climate Smart Agriculture in whatever way you can do as an entrepreneur, as an investor, as a private sector. And we wish you a very, very uh, good day, good evening, and good night for those who are in different time zones. Enjoy the evening. And thank you very much for being part of the session. Thank you very much. <laughs>